Welcome to Prophecy Countdown with author and pastor Kenneth Baer. Join us every week for the latest updates on what the Bible has to say about the events, the characters, and prophetic signs of the return of Jesus Christ and His coming kingdom. Make sure you not only subscribe, but like your favorite episodes and share it with your friends. Now, on with the broadcast. Welcome to Prophecy Countdown. I'm Pastor Ken. And the title of my message today is number 405, The King is Coming. And we'll be looking at uh, just 11 verses in the 20th chapter of Matthew 21. Uh, that's verses 1 through through 11. Prophecy Countdown Podcast is a ministry of faith dialogue, a faith-based ministry. And, and really, all we'd like to do is just hear from you. Send us your comments, your questions, and any ideas for future episodes. Our updates um, uh, these past few weeks, for example, have all come in from, from listeners and viewers like you, um, people that have an idea uh, for one of our updates. So send us an email at prophecycountdownpodcast at gmail.com. Our Sunday messages premiere at 1 p.m., every Sunday, and then on Wednesdays, our Prophecy Updates premiere at 11 a.m. I do want to remind you, I have a book uh, on uh, Zulan. It was published by Zulan. It's called The Apocalypse in Coming Kingdom. In fact, just this last week, it was released as well on Audible. So just type in my name or the name of the book, The Apocalypse in Coming Kingdom, on Amazon and order yourself a copy. So let's get to today's topic, number 405, the king is coming. Today we examine one of the, what could be described uh, by many as the beginning of the end, a very significant moment uh, that's recorded in the gospel of Matthew chapter 21 as Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. This is the event the church observes annually called Palm Sunday, and we'll dig into these 11 verses in chapter 21. Let me go ahead and read these verses first. Uh, this is Matthew writing in ver starting in verse 1. Now when they drew near Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled what was spoken of by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on him, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! To the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. So here's the scene. Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, and this is the week of Passover. Scholars suggest that for Passover, there would be something like 500,000 to 1 million people in Jerusalem during this first century. Now, Jerusalem was a relatively small city compared to today's standards, but it had a large capacity to accommodate pilgrims, including uh, large rooms or large space in the temple courts and temporary tent cities that would rise up. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah, about the coming of the king. But it also begs the question, why did Jesus go public on his ministry now, at this very moment? As we read through the New Testament, one of the interesting observations is how many times Jesus tells people to keep what they, have, what they know, uh, what they've seen, what they've witnessed, uh, or what they, what's been revealed to them a secret. In the gospel accounts, Jesus told people not to tell others about what transpired or that he was the Messiah. 
multiple times. Uh, here are some of the examples. For example, there's the healing of the leper in Matthew chapter 8. After cleansing the leper, Jesus says this. He says, see now that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest. And then there's the healing of Jairus' daughter in Mark chapter 5 and also in Luke chapter 8. After raising Jairus' daughter from the dead, Jesus gives strict orders to all of those that were present not to let anyone know about this. Then there was the healing of the blind men in Matthew chapter 9. After healing the men, Jesus sternly warns them, saying, see that no one knows about this. After the transfiguration, Jesus is with Peter, James, and John, and he instructs them. He says, do not tell anyone they have what they had seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And then finally, we have Peter's confession that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone about him. So why now? Well, there are two reasons. Remember that there are two reasons. Let me do the first one first. First is that Jesus knew that this was his time. When they drew near Jerusalem, Jesus knew that the religious leaders were going to arrest him. They were going to condemn him and mock him and scourge him and develop, deliver him to the Romans and that he would be crucified. We just read that in uh, chapter 20 of, uh, of Matthew, that he, he tells his disciples this. If Jesus had not deliberately suppressed his, popular, his popularity um, and his credentials as the Messiah, and the Messiah, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees would have been pressing in to do away with him before the appointed time. But now, coming into Jerusalem, Jesus says, go into the village opposite you. Immediately, you'll find a donkey along with a colt. Loose them, bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, says the Lord has need of them. Well, this is remarkable. However, Jesus' prophecy, his instructions about what to do, his clairvoyancy, is not without precedent. Jesus often demonstrated his divine foreknowledge, his authority, by instructing his disciples in ways that revealed events or, or things that were going to happen beforehand. For example, in the miraculous catch of the fish, Jesus instructed Simon Peter. He said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. If you remember the story, Peter says, well, we've done this, uh, but because, nevertheless, because of your word, we will lay, let down the nets. And what happened? Well, they caught so many fish that the fish were about to sink the boat. And then there was also the coin in the mouth. Remember, it was again Peter. Jesus told Simon Peter, he said, cast a hook, take out the fish, and, and that comes up first. And when you've opened its mouth, you'll find a piece of money. Take it to the tax collectors for my taxes and for yours. That's in Matthew chapter 17. And, and we see that this, this first reason why Jesus knew it was his time now. He had been teaching and preaching and healing and serving for, for over three years with 12 disciples. And now the appointed time was right for the Messiah to go public. But if you remember, I mentioned that there were two reasons. And the second one has to do with this prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah wrote this incredible prophecy about the king coming and sitting on, lowly on a donkey 516 years before Jesus was even born. And get this, he's not the only one that's prophesying. Nine years after Zechariah writes this prophecy, the prophet Daniel has take, been taken captive and is in, Dan, in Babylon. It's 538 BC and the Daniel, and Daniel is writing chapter nine of his book, we know the prophecy of Daniel, and he's writing about the 77s, the 70 weeks of years, about the regathering of Israel and the coming of the Messiah. If you're unfamiliar with the prophecy, it begins like this. This Daniel writes in, in uh, chapter 9, verse 20, he says this. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man, meaning the angel I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight. 
You see, the angel Gabriel comes flying in and tells Zechariah that there will be 77s or 70 weeks, 70 weeks of years, a total of 490 years. And we find out these 490 years are reserved for, Jeru for Israel. These 77s begin uh, like a stopwatch. And the stopwatch starts from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The prophecy is a companion to Zechariah chapter 9 as Daniel is, talks about the time of the Messiah, the prince, exactly what Zechariah is talking about. What's amazing about these two prophecies, the one in Daniel and the one in Zechariah, is that they are fulfilled at the same time with the coming of the Messiah, the king sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Both of these prophecies speak of the first arrival of the Messiah, the first coming, the first advent. And remember, it was Daniel's prophecy that actually gives us a timeline. Uh, and that I find this completely amazing. That's why we do Prophecy Countdown. That's why I spend so much of my time talking and writing and preaching and teaching about prophecy. First Daniel said a command will be given, then seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, seven and 62 equals 69, or 483 years until the Messiah, the prince. Now, 483 from 490 leaves seven. Seven remaining years, we note it as the tribulation period, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, on another day. Scholars have done the math. And from the time King Artaxerxes issued the decree on March 14th, 445 B.C., and then counting 483 years, adjusting for the difference between 360, which is a Jewish calendar, and 365, which is our calendar, and also accounting for an additional 116 days to, uh, to account for the leap years, we come to April 6th, 32 A.D., and scholars tell us that was the exact day that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday. You see, my friends, there are, there are many people that even when they're shown this and other prophecies that are fulfilled literally, they still remain skeptical. But please, please don't harden your heart. Let me tell you this as earnestly as I can. Jesus was waiting for this one specific day when Daniel and Zechariah predicted that a Messiah would come riding on a colt into Jerusalem. Jesus eagerly awaited this particular day. It was foretold by Daniel and Zechariah when, again, the Messiah would make himself known. The people's proclamation about Jesus was clear. It's unmistakable. The crowd shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, a messianic term. The Pharisees recognized the significance of these words. The people believed Jesus was the promised Messiah, and Jesus accepted their praise as a testimony to the truthfulness of what was being said. Now, unfortunately, many of these same people that cried out Hosanna on Palm Sunday that then were shouting, crucify him, crucify him later the same week. Jesus first coming as the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world through shedding of his blood was a mystery. It wasn't revealed to the prophets that the Messiah would actually come twice, once as a sacrificial lamb and then once more as the conquering king. You see, Jesus was crucified. He died and was buried and then rose three days later from the dead, again in the fulfillment of prophecy. Now, he will come again, the New Testament tells us, as the bridegroom who returns for his bride. These are the words of Jesus, that he would come back. We are so close, my friends. We are so close to his return. We should also be shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. And I would add the words of Revelation chapter 20, where John writes, come quickly. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let me go ahead and pray. So Father God, we want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. 
Nearly every day, it's common to see, read, or hear something about the end of the world, the apocalypse, or end times. Author and pastor Kenneth Baer's The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom zooms in and breaks down biblical prophecy as it relates to Jesus' imminent return and the coming seven-year period, including the Great Tribulation. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Get your copy on Amazon or at Barnes & Noble and select Christian bookstores. The title again is The Apocalypse and Coming Kingdom. You can also find it listed by author Kenneth Baer. Get your copy today. Thank you for joining us on Prophecy Countdown with Pastor Ken Baer. Don't leave without first sharing the latest episode with your friends. Be sure to join us again for the latest updates on Prophecy Countdown.